we will be involved in. Uh, we might sneak one more session in somewhere along the way there to uh, make up, because we're a little behind already. Uh, Lord willing, we will finish Lordship Salvation tonight, and then um, we will have the Crossless Gospel issue uh, next week, or in two weeks, I should say, with Tom Stiegel teaching on that. And then we'll just keep on going in contemporary theological issues. So before we get started tonight, let's have a word of prayer and we will begin. Our Father, thank you again for your wonderful word and an opportunity to look into it. And we just pray that you would direct us now as we study the scriptures. We trust that the Holy Spirit would give us insight and illumination in understanding the text of scripture correctly as well as Uh, insight into what this means in light of the whole of Scripture as well as our lives. Father, we know that you want to use us more than we are willing to be used or are usable in your hands. And so we just pray that even tonight would contribute to our overall spiritual growth in the Word of God, in our own personal walk, and in a teaching ministry we know that ultimately the objective of Gibbs is to equip believers to be faithful, grace-oriented expositors of Scripture for your glory in the building of your church. And so I trust that you will grant me what I stand in need of and everyone here as well and those who are watching tonight, whether in Milwaukee or Minneapolis or somewhere else. So we commit all this to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we get started. I first of all need a cell number for those who are out there watching in Milwaukee and so forth who may have a question. So who do we want to do? Pucci, did we do that for you last time? Okay, so you want to... Okay, here's the number. 218... 409-7908, taking text messages. For your questions, usually uh, it's about a minute and a half or two minute delay in some of these other places. And so if we get ahead, we'll just stop and go back and take a look at what it's saying. So I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles with me to First Timothy chapter 4 as we get started tonight and have some pondering the page. 1 Timothy chapter 4. A lot of noise coming from that table tonight already. Okay, We're going to focus on verse 16, but obviously a text without a context is a pretext, so let's begin reading in verse 1. Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and the doctrines of demons. I think what we'll have you do is we'll have you read every other verse, so we'll have you read verse 2 now, okay? Speaking lies... Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. But reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise yourself towards godliness. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. These things command and teach. Tell 
till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Meditate on these things, give yourself entirely to them, that your progress may be evident to all. Now, 1 Timothy is a pastoral epistle. It's one of three, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus, in which it's written to an individual, in this case, involved in a pastoral kind of ministry. And we know that Timothy was at Ephesus, Titus was at Crete, and as a result, they were involved in the ministry of the Word of God. Now, I want to examine closely with you verse 16, and make some appropriate applications to your Christian life and ministry for Jesus Christ's sake. Verse 16 is a simple verse. It's basic, uncomplicated words, and, but it's a significant verse as it deals with Paul's conclusion and closing application to this section. And it breaks down into two commands. Can you see them? Okay, first one, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Second one, continue in them. Those are the two commands. Now, with those two commands are two consequences. Can you see them? For in doing this, consequence one, you will both save yourself and and those who hear you. So we have two commands and we have two consequences. Now, in observing the text, we want to look, first of all, at this phrase, take heed. It's a fairly common word in the New Testament, and it's used in Matthew 6, 1, take heed, that you do not alms before men to be seen of men. It's used in Matthew 7, 15, beware of false prophets. It's used in Acts 20, 28, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you Overseers, it means to turn one's attention to something. Especially so as to avoid something which would be harmful. Weiss translates this, keep on paying careful attention to yourself and to the teaching. Williams translates this, make it your habit to pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Phillips translates this, keep a critical eye both upon your own life and the teaching you give. What two things are you to make a habit to pay close attention to? The two things that are mentioned is number one, yourself, and number two, the doctrine. First of all, to yourself. And this is so critical when it comes to ministry, that you take heed to yourself. And in this context, I would understand this to mean your personal life, your own personal walk, refers to the spiritual care of the man, and to the doctrine, doctrine, public teaching, the public teaching. This is the message. So we see, take, as it were, we'll put this the messenger. Take heed to the messenger and to the message. Now do you think both of these areas are significant? They're critically significant. Why? Because you don't teach in a vacuum. You're teaching the context of your own walk with the Lord, your own growth in the Lord, your own emotional, spiritual state as well. So take heed to yourself as well as to the doctrine. And both again are needed. Now even about your own personal life, the scriptures are replete with many verses that encourage you to to walk by faith and to walk in the Spirit and to be growing in your Christian life, walking in the light as He is in the light, that you have fellowship one with another, as well as to the doctrine, to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman 
that doesn't need to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. And be not many teachers, for they shall receive the greater judgment. And I think there is a significance even to the order here. Take heed to yourself, speaking of the vertical, and to your public teaching, speaking of the horizontal, towards others. You see, God is first of all concerned about who you are more than what you are doing. He's concerned about being versus doing. The vertical before the horizontal. As I've said many times, just stay focused on the vertical and God will direct you on the horizontal. You know, be concerned about the, the depth of your life and God will take care of the breadth of your ministry, as it were. And in order to fulfill this first command, now what's necessary? For you to take heed to yourself requires what? Well, it requires a willingness to do this, a teachable, correctable, humble attitude. And too often, that's missing among believers. They're not willing to be corrected. They're not willing to evaluate. Or they evaluate in such a way in which, in many cases, they just you know, evaluate extremely favorable about everything about them. In fact, sometime in the next month or so, we're going to ask you to... Um, meet with us in spiritual leadership here and to have what we call a Gibbs checkup. And it's just a time for us to get some feedback from you and to find out how you're doing and what you're thinking and where you're at and so forth. And as you know, on those checkups, sometimes we'll ask questions like, where do you have any desire for ministry in any of these areas? Where do you sense your spiritual gifts lie in these areas? You know, how are you doing in your marriage? How are you doing in your walk? How are you doing balancing your family? So forth and so forth. What are we encouraging you to do to take heed to yourself? But you know, we've had some gift students in the past when it comes to giftedness, and we list these very spiritual gifts, and, and we've had some check them all. Like they were, you know, Superman, and they're just looking for kryptonite somewhere, you know. They just had such a high opinion of their own giftedness. We've had to say, you know, you're not God. I mean, come on. Take heed to yourself. Get some objective feedback in your life. And when it comes to taking heed to yourself, take heed to your thinking. Are you thinking principally, your motives? Why are you doing what you're doing? Are you doing it as unto the Lord or not? Your actions... Your habits, your priorities, your focus. Take heed to yourself. Now, I'm not suggesting constant introspection so that you get your eyes off Jesus Christ. But I have run into people from time to time who don't take the time to stop and evaluate hardly at all. They're just out hustling for the Lord and they're assuming they're doing great spiritually and they don't stop and say, Lord, Search me and know me and know my ways and see if there's any wicked way in me. Lord, I have no claim to fame. I am nothing in myself. I can do nothing of myself. Lord, I am just a willing instrument in your hands. And Lord, if there's something here that needs to get corrected, indeed, Lord, by your grace, this is what I want. Take heed to yourself. Now, this is where also as iron sharpens iron, so one person can sharpen another. This is where, at times, individuals could be of help to you. Excuse me. And I recognize when people give you feedback, <coughs> you have to evaluate that, pray about that. But that's one of the roles of spiritual leadership at times is to give you feedback. At times maybe to confirm something in your mind, to encourage you or even to challenge you. And I would encourage you to just take it from the Lord. Pray about it, evaluate and let the Lord show you. Don't react, just respond. Be teachable, be humble. Because we know it need to take heed to ourselves and to the doctrine. To the doctrine. Now the doctrine obviously is the public teaching of the word of God. And you know, that's why you're in Gibbs. 
Or to some degree, you have not only a great interest to learn the word, but in some capacity have some desire to teach the word in the future, or at least you're seeking to evaluate and see if that is the case or not. And as you know, there's a great need for grace-oriented, Bible-teaching missionaries, pastors, and teachers of God's word out there. Not only in our church, as we think of the next generation coming up, we think of some of the folks in our church getting older and older and will be needing replacement down the road, but also even just the landscape all around us. You know, I was just talking to a pastor here recently who approached me about the possibility of, of someone being involved in, in uh, planting a church, as it were, in a location. Would we have any Gibbs people available to do that? You see, the need is great. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. And by the way, when it comes to the doctrine, it will be tested. And it needs to be squared with Scripture. And at times you will be challenged as to what you believe, why you believe it, and is it really rooted in Scripture or not. And we need never fear going back to the Word of God and making sure that what we believe is truly in line with Scripture. But remember, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And I would encourage you immensely to be faithful before the Lord in your walk, in your study of the Word of God. Don't get behind. Try to stay on task and be faithful to what the Lord has has called you to do. Now, how often is this necessary to take heed to yourself and to the doctrine? Well, the word take heed is in the present tense means over and over again. Over and over again. Repeatedly as needed. Again, not constant introspection, looking to the Lord, but a willingness to let the Spirit of God show you what He wants to show you when He wants you to see it. Now, does this come about by accident? And the answer is no. For this word, take heed, is in the active voice. This is something you must choose to do. And let me just encourage you, as I think of this, to don't neglect your spiritual walk with the Lord. Don't neglect your spiritual priorities. And by the way, you can't live on your mate's fellowship or someone else's. Someone else's fellowship can encourage you. But you can't live on it. You've got to have your own fellowship with the Lord. You've got to taste and see the Lord is good yourself. You have to be willing to just walk personally with him every day. And, and he is so gracious and so faithful and so willing. But we are so prone to independency that we need to take heed to ourselves and to the doctrine. That's the first instruction in this summarizing verse of verse 16. As we think of taking heed to the doctrine, I think of verse 6 there. If you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of good doctrine, which you have carefully followed. Verse 13, till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. And don't ever underestimate the importance of doctrine. And by the way, you don't have to make doctrine relevant. Doctrine is relevant. Sound Bible teaching in itself is irrelevant. It's timeless and it's needed. And the Lord would have to direct you as to the applications you would make in light of the audience that you have, whether you're teaching Sunday school or an adult elective class down the road or in some church plant or whatever. The Lord would have to direct you. Now, in verse 14, it says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. You say, no, what does that mean? Well, let, let me clarify. First of all, he's reminding him that he has a spiritual gift, the gift of pastor, teacher, at least teacher, and that he wasn't to neglect this. He was to recognize God had given them this gift. Now, accompanying that spiritual gift, which are given to you at salvation 
though through spiritual growth they, you get developed so that you can properly express it within the context that God has designed for you, was also a prophecy that was made about Timothy. Some, a prophetic utterance was given to someone about Timothy and his ministry. And also, if you notice closely there, it says, which was given to you by prophecy, with, and the word with is the Greek term accompanying with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. In other words, there was not only a prophetic utterance, but the eldership, the elders of the local church, came and they put their hands, as it were, on Timothy and they said, we believe this is what the Lord has, we are behind you, we are supportive of you, in a sense, and we are appointing you into this role. And by the way, that is one of the functions of, of spiritual leaders again. And what's interesting is he didn't go parachurch, he didn't bypass local church, he didn't bypass spiritual leadership. That was all part of the confirming process. And spiritual leadership, when they're walking with the Lord and wanting to further the word of God, isn't going to hold you back. It's going to be used of the Lord to confirm. And in fact, those who think they don't need that and they can go without it, oftentimes do so to their own detriment in light of the fact that God has designed this blueprint, which when followed, works according to the way God wants it to be. You know, sometimes people get a big head and they start to believe their own press clippings and they start to think that somehow they're going to do great things for God and somehow the spiritual leadership, even at Duluth Bible, is holding them back. And the fact is, we have, by the grace of God, a lot of vision and a lot of willingness to step out and be directed of the Lord to do things that in many cases, other local churches haven't even attempted to do. We're not holding you back, though sometimes it could be that you're running ahead. And as a result, it looks like we're holding you back simply because there are things that aren't confirmed or situations or character flaws or something that is hindering you and I, or you're not really just where you need to be yet. And I want you to notice here that Timothy was not an independent lone wolfer on his own, doing great things for God. He worked through the local church. He worked through the local church leadership in all of this and was given a ministry here, as it were, in Ephesus. Verse 15, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your spiritual progress may be evident to all. Now, you don't do it so that everyone sees your growth, but that will be the result. As you walk with the Lord and you're taking in the Word of God and you're meditating on these things, you're going to grow. And people are going to notice that. Continue. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Number two, continue in them. The word continue is the Greek word epimeno. Epimeno. It means to stay by them, to stick to them. It refers to persistence and perseverance. Continue in them. What's them in reference to? Taking heed to yourself and to the doctrine. In other words, you may start out well, but will you continue well? Will you remain where you need to be? Will you remain taking heed in your own walk with the Lord? Will you remain taking heed to the doctrine of the Word of God? In other words, make it a habit to pay close attention to your own walk with the Lord and the public teaching of Scripture. Persist in this and don't give up. Don't quit. Don't let your guard down. Don't become slack in these things. They are both must to faithful ministry. And why is a command to continue needed? Because personal carnality can happen at any time. Especially when you get busy. When you get busy, it's easy to not take heed to yourself. 
You don't have time to stop and think and evaluate and pray. Because I've got things to do. And someday I've got things to do for God. And furthermore, doctrinal apostasy can occur in your life. It's occurred in others. Better men than you have fallen doctrinally and than me. So we need to continue in the doctrine. Don't vacation from the Lord. Don't become spiritually out of touch. And by God's grace, be faithful to the Lord in the long haul. Two commands. Do you understand them clearly? Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. And number two, continue in them. Continue in them. Now, following those two commands are two consequences. Two things that are going to happen as God works in your life and then through you in ministering to someone else. And before considering those two consequences, please note the condition to be fulfilled in order to expect the result. For in doing this. Now it doesn't say intending to do it. It didn't say hoping to do it, but in doing this, there needs to be the genuine application of this in your life. And in doing this, number one, you will save both yourself and number two, you will save those who hear you. Now what does this mean? Well again, you know that the word save here, depending on the context, can refer to various things. I believe as Paul is writing to Timothy here, who was already justified but clearly not glorified, that he's talking about it will save from spiritual damage. From spiritual damage. The kind of damage he's talking about earlier in the chapter. Will save from spiritual damage both yourself as you're walking with the Lord, and those who hear you as you're communicating sound doctrine to them. And that is what you want, right? You want the unbeliever to be saved, and then you want believers to be saved from themselves, and saved from the power of sin, and saved from spiritual damage in your, their life. And keep in mind, you can't save them, but you can be used of the Lord to teach the Word of God, to point them to Christ, so that they, as they hear you, can respond to the Word of God in their own lives and realizing the resources of God's grace, learn to walk by faith and be saved. Second tense. And this is a good example. With, with, apart from understanding of three tenths of salvation, this would be utterly confusing. So let's stop and apply it to your life and mine. What has the Lord said here? The Lord has said to us, number one, we need to take heed to our own walk with the Lord and our own growth in the Lord. We need to turn our attention, not from the Lord, but in looking to the Lord, how we're responding and relating to Him. And number two, to the doctrine of the Word of God the public teaching of Scripture here. We're to continue in this. You said, well, I did that last week. You all praise the Lord. What about this week? Continue in them. Don't take a vacation from the Lord. And it's easy to mentally vacation from the Lord. And in doing this, not hoping to do it, intending to do it, but in making this application in your life, the results that God will produce in you and through you is, number one, you will save both yourself, and number two, you will save those who hear you. As God uses you as an instrument in his hand. You say, well, it's the word of God that does that. It's absolutely true. But he uses human instruments to communicate that word. And Satan knows that. And that's why Satan wants to lead you astray, wants you to get you know, out of touch with the Lord, walking carnality. 
and so forth. And frankly, the hills are strewn with believers. In some cases, pastors and missionaries and others who at one time were being used of the Lord, were one time walking with the Lord, but failed to take heed to themselves and failed to take heed to the doctrine. And as a result, they're no longer walking with the Lord or they had a serious moral failure or some other problem or issue surfaced in their life. And you know, we're in a very real spiritual battle. Very real. And we need to take these things to heart. And it's been said before, but it bears repeating. The easiest place to backslide is in seminary. I don't know who said it, but obviously probably someone who knew it very well. And the same is true in the Grace Institute. You can just go through the performance and perfunctuary of it all. You can just do your assignments. You can show up to class and so forth. But are you really taking heed to yourself? Are you making sure the, eye, the beam is out of your own eye? Are you making sure that you're confessing your own sins? Are you making sure that you're looking to Jesus Christ and walking in dependence upon Him? Are you really teachable? Or when someone corrects you, are you devastated? Because it really was so much about you and not about the Lord, though you said it was about the Lord. And the fact is, when you get devastated, when you get corrected, the fact of the matter is, it was a whole lot more about you than you think. Because how do you devastate a dead man? And if you're reckoning yourself dead to sin and alive to God, how do you devastate the pride of a dead man? The fact is, we're a whole lot more lively than we'd like to think. And so, I encourage you to take these things to heart tonight before we begin studying on Lordship Salvation. As we pause for a word of prayer, Martin, would you pray for us? Amen. Get our little clicker out here. Yes. Meditate on these things. Mm-hmm. Is that everything in chapter four? I think it's probably referring to that. It's referring to, the question is, is meditate on these things, what is the antecedent of these? And I would assume it's what he's been talking about in chapter 4, the incoming of false teaching, the importance of being a faithful minister, the importance of growing in the Lord yourself and being a good example, you know, and being fulfilling the role that he has, verse 13, and and not neglecting the gift, verse 14. So I'm assuming that's what he's referring to there. Any other questions before we move on there? Okay. Now, what we're going to do is spend the rest of our night talking about Lordship Salvation. If you have a question along the way, don't hesitate to ask. I'm not trying to beat a dead horse, but this is something you must know very well. It is extremely prevalent and pervasive in our day and believers need a clarion call of sound doctrine and grace orientation in order to see through this and not be adversely influenced by it. Now I'm going to take some time and review tonight as we get started and then launch from where we left off last time. And you will be... Uh, 
receiving a test on this sometime in the next uh, week or so in which we'll just have a take-home test, I think is what we'll do, and just let you take it home and, and I'll just send it to you via email and you can just answer it and send it back and we'll be on a good honor system. I trust that before the Lord you'll do it as unto him. So, let's make sure we're clear on these things. First of all, the position. What is lordship salvation? The adherents of this view teach that in order to be saved, you must be willing or actually turn from your sins, their view of repentance, and totally submit or surrender to Christ's lordship or mastery over your daily life. And keep in mind, the word totally is not inappropriate. It is used oftentimes by lordship. And all of this is subsumed under saving faith. In other words, saving faith involves repentance, it involves surrender, it involves commitment, it involves obedience, and so forth and so forth. And by the way, as you know from the two previous studies, I had a lot of quotes on all of this, so that it's very clear I am not taking things out of context. The quotes are myriad in number. The adherents of this view teach that if you are truly saved, you will live a fruitful, righteous, godly lifestyle. Now keep that in mind. And have a faith that endures and perseveres to the end of your life or you will lose your salvation, the Arminian view, as there are Arminian lordshippers. Or you were never really saved, the Calvinistic view, of lordship. And keep in mind, not all Calvinists are lordshippers, though I will point out by the time the evening is done, that if you want as a consistent five-point Calvinist, they have to be a lordshipper. There's no way around it. But there are those who are Calvinistic, like Lewis Berry Chafer or Charles Ryrie and such, who are, were definitely Calvinistic, but not lordship. So there is some distinction to be made there. The adherents of Lordship Salvation arrived at these conclusions due to a dismay at the professing church and its sad spiritual condition, and we would agree. It's Laodicea in nature. A genuine desire for fruitfulness and faithfulness among believers, and again, we certainly sense that need. Combined with faulty exegesis and forced eisegesis that imports or introduces a theological viewpoint upon various passages of Scripture. And I will support tonight that criticism of Lordship Salvation. I've already been pointing several things out. Many more will be addressed tonight. Now we went from the position to the popularizers who teaches Lordship Salvation. John MacArthur, John Piper, R.C. Sproul are the three big names. And there are a number of others that we referred to as well. But keep in mind that this study is not a negative attack on their personal lives. We're not attacking their motives. We're not attacking their sincerity. We're not even saying they're not saved. It is an examination, though, of their teaching of Lordship Salvation under the searchlight of Scripture. And by the way, they've done the same to others' teaching. And scripturally, we are to test all things, hold fast to that which is good, and to abstain from all forms of evil. We then began looking at the problems of Lordship Salvation. and How does the teaching of Lordship Salvation line up with Scripture? We notice, first of all, that Lordship Salvation garbles the Gospel by mixing your works with Christ's finished work. And again, what is the Gospel? Christ died for our sins and rose again in order to provide salvation for us, outside of us, and in spite of us, through his finished work, received through simple childlike faith in him. And it's by grace, and it's not of works. John MacArthur says in the Gospel according to Jesus, Christ challenged the bogus profession of those who called him Lord, but did not really know him, and he made it clear that obedience to divine authority is a prerequisite of entry into the kingdom. Clearly, his lordship is an integral part of the message of salvation. Now, he's quoting, or he's commenting on Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Lord, Lord, haven't we done this? Haven't we done that? Haven't we done this? He missed the whole point. 
The point was, those false professors that were unsaved were relying upon their obedience, on their works, in order to be saved, not in doing the will of God, which involves putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. In his book on faith works, the gospel according to Jesus, he says, Jesus is Lord of all and the faith that he demands involves unconditional surrender. He does not bestow eternal life on those whose hearts remain set against him. Those who truly believe will love Christ. They will therefore long to obey him. Behavior is an important test of faith. Obedience is evidence that one's faith is real. On the other hand, the person who remains utterly unwilling to obey Christ does not evidence true faith. Genuine believers may stumble and fall, but they will persevere in the faith. Those who later turn completely away from the Lord show that they were never truly born again. Now, when it's all said and done, what is being prescribed here involves a lot of works. I don't care how you cut it. You can say, well, this is a divine work in the heart of the believer by which the Lord is the one who produces these things. Well, it still requires a lot of works at the end of the day. It garbles the gospel of mixing your works with Christ's finished work. It is finished. All that is left is we must believe. Secondly, Lordship Salvation redefines the right response of the gospel from faith alone in Christ and his finished work alone by requiring for your salvation the turning from sin, their view of repentance, Submission to Christ's lordship in your daily life, their, their form of commitment, and a lifelong commitment to be obedient to Christ. See, faith no longer means simple trust or believing or being persuaded in order to trust. Now, it's defined in terms of what I would call in many cases work. Like repentance. If repentance is turning from one's sin, how did God repent in the Old Testament? Since he is without sin. And Amos 7, verse 6 tells us the Lord repented. The New American Standard has it right. He changed his mind. So the formula for Lordship salvation is faith in Christ is turning from sin plus total surrender plus lifelong commitment equals eternal salvation. And you can... Again, turn that on all fours and make it squeal and say it's all by grace, but this is clearly works. What about repentance? Involved in salvation is a change of mind, as the word repentance means metanoia, so as to not trust in false religion and dead works that cannot save, and to trust in Jesus Christ alone, who alone can save you. The issue in salvation is not turning from sins in your life as needed as this might be, but turning in faith to the Savior who died for your sins and rose again. Thomas Constable writes, it's asserted that repentance, which is a change of mind, enters of necessity into the very act of believing on Christ, since one cannot turn to Christ from other objects of confidence without that change of mind. And I would say, Amen. Obedience is another key word. And the issue in salvation is not the obedience of one's daily life, to the mastery of Christ, but to obey the gospel by believing it. Lord, who hath believed our report? That's the question. They have not all obeyed the gospel, for Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? And then commitment. The issue in salvation is not one of making some promise and pledge to God to do something for him, but involves entrusting your eternal destiny to Jesus Christ, whom you have trusted to save you. In fact, this is just such an amazing quote, I thought I should repeat it tonight again. It just blows me away that when people read this or hear this, they're not screaming, that's works. He stated, self-discipline comes when you look back to the covenant of your salvation. When you look back to the covenant of your salvation. That is to say, when you remember that at a point of your salvation, you made a promise to submit to the Lord. You made a pledge at that time to be obedient to Christ. You confessed Him as Lord, and Lord means that He is above all. It's essential then as believers to remember that we made a covenant of obedience 
when we confess Jesus as Lord. We were saved unto obedience, which God had before ordained that we should walk in obedience, characterized by good works and obedience to God's word. That pledge was inherent in salvation. God, at the time you came to him for salvation, promised you forgiveness and eternal life and all the grace necessary to fulfill his will and the Holy Spirit, and you pledged obedience. And you need to go back and remember that and have the integrity to be faithful to your original promise. And that's incredible. Salvation comes by, God says, I'll give you this gift as long as you promise me your obedience. Can you imagine any type of gift like that at Christmas? Charles Ryrie states, the importance of this question cannot be overestimated in relation to both salvation and sanctification. The message of faith only and the message of faith plus commitment of life cannot both be the gospel. Therefore, one of them is false and comes under the curse of perverting the gospel or preaching another gospel. I agree. Yes, Mark. Okay. Uh, the comment was, whenever works are involved in salvation, would that not be a way for that group or people to control the individual? And I think what it does is it puts you on a performance-based acceptance, which is what legalism always does. And legalism always puts you into bondage, and it's a form of control. To what degree? It depends on the group. Like, yeah, giving, like serving, or whatever. Is saving faith a gift from God? And the answer was no. In fact, the word saving faith, I don't even particularly care for it, though I do can interact with it because I understand theologically what people are talking about. But salvation or eternal life, not faith, is the gift of God received through childlike faith in Jesus Christ alone. Is saving faith a special kind of faith? And the answer is, is no. It is your faith which is non-meritorious in a saving or special object, the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work. Notice, but to him who does not work, but believes. Which means believing is not a work, which means believing is consistent with grace, which means believing is non-meritorious, and that's why, for by grace you've been saved through faith. Grace and faith go together. They're both non-meritorious because the value of your faith lies not in your faith but in your object of faith. And that's why you believe on Him who justified the ungodly. His faith, not God's gift to you, but His faith is accounted for righteousness. Do the Scriptures teach easy believism? The scriptures teach that salvation involves simple trust like a child has, but believing is not always easy. And you have to keep in mind, you've got lordship here. We'll put that over here. And then you can have what Michael Kokoris calls decisionism here. And by decisionism, he's talking about raising a hand, signing a card, walking forward, asking Jesus in your heart, saying the sinner's prayer. And this, remember... Lordshippers call this easy believism, but they also lump us who would say, no, it involves personal trust in Jesus Christ alone. They'll oftentimes lump us under easy believism too. And we would certainly disagree with this, and certainly disagree with this, and agree with Acts 16.31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Okay, Robert? Yes, the question is, um, don't people who sign a card or raise a hand think they have to believe something? Sure, they do, and they think that uh, since I asked Jesus into my heart, I'm saved. That's what they believe. I signed a card, I made a decision for Christ, but it doesn't mean they understand the gospel. 
In fact, I was talking to a fella, Roberto Cadena, who's been a translator for us down in El Salvador. He lives in the Dallas area. And he told me that he worked at a, I think it was a Billy Graham crusade once, years ago. But it was somebody. And this lady came forward, and he was one of the counselors. So he took her aside and said, so do you know for sure you're saved now? And she said, yes. I said, well, why? He said, because I came forward. And I said, you came forward. Well, what do you believe? I'm not sure, but I came forward. And he said, if I came forward, I was saved. So she had faith in her coming forward. It was just another religious work that they were doing. Now, I did watch, um, you know, now that I, I, I've got my $86 digital TV, which Jeff Nichols was in line on Black Friday and he got it for me. And uh, I don't watch hardly any TV. I mean, I, watch a, I watched a, some football yesterday, but otherwise I, I don't watch it. But there's a Christian channel on the digital. I, I don't know, 27, yeah. And at 7 to 8, almost every night has Todd Friel. Is that his name, Friel? Todd Friel. And uh, he likes to openly take on the charismatics and other things. And a lot of things he says is true. In fact, it's pretty shocking some of the video clip he shows of what's going out there in the International House of Prayer and the Toronto Blessing and the Apostolic Movement and so forth. But he was talking about uh, the other day about people aren't saved by saying the sinner's prayer. And I agree. The problem was then he goes the other way and has some kind of lordship gospel message in which you have to repent from your sins and truly believe in your heart. And, and if you're really saved, you're going to live this way. And if you don't live this way, it's proof that you're really not saved and so forth. And again, the, again, the tendency is to jump from one ditch to the other ditch and miss the road. Okay, Philip? Yes, okay. So the question is, well, when someone gets saved, isn't there a decision that goes on? And the answer is absolutely yes. Absolutely yes. And that's why decisionism may, you know, maybe there's a better word for this. It's just that easy believism, see, we get lumped in that. And we do believe it's as easy as believing. That's true. It's as simple as believing. Because Christ did it all. And there is a decision to be made. And that's why... Almost every salvation verse that has the word believe in it, the word believe is almost always in the active voice. What does that mean? You choose it. But the emphasis isn't on the choice, it's on the object you choose. And so as active voice, there is a choice, there is a decision to be made when someone gets saved, but it's not the same as decisionism as I defined it. Okay, did I see another hand here somewhere? Yes, John? Yeah, yeah. when people reject the sinner's prayer, a lot of times they jump way over here to lordship. And again, they miss it. What about the accusation of cheap grace? The Bible does not teach cheap grace as God's gift of salvation cost him the death of his son while it cost the believing sinner nothing for Jesus paid it all. Cheap means it would cost the sinner something. And by the way, you know, sometimes those in free grace circles, or someone will say, well, isn't that redundant, free grace? Well, it is, but it's as redundant as Romans 3.24. <laughs> Being justified freely by his grace. No, that's redundant. But it's purposely redundant. And even then people don't get it. And it's freely and it's by his grace because Jesus Christ paid the price when he died on the cross to provide redemption, and God has accepted that as a propitiation by his blood, his precious blood of Christ. Is God's simple plan of salvation clear to you, or is your mind being corrupted by false teaching from the simplicity that is in Christ? And by the way, that's found in what passage? 
2 Corinthians 11.3. And who is he writing to, believers or unbelievers? Believers. Can believers have their minds corrupted? Absolutely. So, when asked, where do you stand on the lordship issue? We've tried to give you some kind of spectrum to this. If I could, you've got MacArthur over here, you've got, you've got Hodges over here, you've got Ryrie in the middle, and we're somewhere here. Disagreeing with Hodges on various things, not fully in agreement with Ryrie on a few things. We're somewhere, we're comfortable here with Ryrie, but not in full agreement, and more uncomfortable with Hodges and some of the very novel, new, different interpretations. And by the way, they're getting worse. They're getting worse. And the reason for that is because if you could allow this to be sound doctrine, a straight line, once you veer from that after a while, down the road it's a lot farther than where it was initially. And this crossless gospel thing has forced them to reevaluate a lot of things and make adjustments in other areas now to accommodate it. And as a result, it's getting farther and farther, and in my estimation, more bizarre. Okay, question. Okay. Okay. The question is, uh, Zane Hodges, um, what are we uncomfortable about? Well, Hodges definitely took on MacArthur when he, MacArthur came out with his book on Lordship Salvation. Hodges responded with the book Absolutely Free, as well as he responded with a couple other small books. Um, and in doing so, he took some views that I'm uncomfortable with regarding the overcomers, regarding wailing gnashing of teeth, uh, some things regarding rewards I would agree with, but some things I would clearly disagree with. And I would contend that oftentimes those in the Grace Evangelical Society, which I was a member of for 20-some years, um, that the views they're taking today is basically lordship salvation second tense. The, what lordshippers do to first tense, they do to second tense, and they ultimately are teaching, in many cases, faith plus works equals sanctification. And they're pretty open about it. And if you don't hustle enough, you're going to experience outer darkness, wailing, gnashing of teeth, millennial loss for sure, and perhaps even millennial exclusion. There are those who believe that to him that overcometh, he will not be hurt by the second death. If you are not an overcoming Christian, some will be actually cast into the Gehenna for a thousand years and totally miss the kingdom and praise the Lord we believe in grace. How ironic in it all. Okay, John? Yes. Yeah, part of dealing with the accusation of antinomianism and also, I believe, due to a failure to strongly teach positional truth, you have to come up with things to motivate believers and this is what they've done. And they've taken passages out of the synoptic gospels that are clearly Jewish in nature and they applied them erroneously to the church at the exclusion of a truly grace orientation when it comes to Christian living and service. I, I know some would disagree with that evaluation, but I think it's, it's very justified on a whole. Okay, number three, we covered Lordship Salvation Confuses Christian Carnality by denying its ongoing possibility or reality while then disregarding blatant scriptural contradictions in several examples of passages. By the way, if you don't believe in Christian carnality, can you explain to me practical exhortations in the Bible? Why would he tell believers to become holy as he is holy if they're going to obviously be that if they're truly saved? Why do you tell them to walk in the Spirit and they won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh if indeed all genuine believers are going to walk in the Spirit? It, it renders exhortations meaningless. And again... It denies the ongoing possibility or reality of the carnal Christian. 
Is there such a thing as a carnal Christian? We pointed out four times in four verses in 1 Corinthians 3, he says you are carnal. And thus we understand, the Bible teaches, there's a natural man, a spiritual man, and a carnal man. The natural man, again, is unsaved. The spiritual man is saved. The carnal man is saved. The assets of the spiritual and carnal believer are identical But the spiritual believer's problem is none in the sense that he's yielding and responding to the word of God. He's not resisting where the carnal believer is. And as a result, the chief characteristic of the spiritual believer, he's positive towards the word of God. He's willing to be taught in contrast to the carnal believer. Now, Can a carnal believer in Christ be consistently carnal? Well, the Corinthians were, verse 3, For you are still carnal. And Paul is writing this uh, a few years after he was there. So clearly they can be. And again, the church was characterized by all kinds of problems and a great need for correction in light of their characterization of carnality. Furthermore, the Bible is clear that if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. How can you have a believer who suffers loss of a reward. And remember, I believe that scriptures teach either you get a reward or no reward, though there can be degrees within a reward. How can you have a believer who suffers loss of potential reward without him being carnal? But he himself will be saved, yet so as, through the fire. Does God discipline believers who persist in sin? And the answer again, Clearly, yes. He did that with the Corinthians and he promises in Hebrew 12 out of love to do it to all believers. The fourth issue we had with Lordship Salvation is it fails to properly distinguish the biblical truths of justification before God and practical sanctification in time. What do Lordship Salvation teachers teach regarding these matters? Well, Grace Community Church where John MacArthur pastors states in their paper on their distinctives that scripture teaches that real faith inevitably produces a changed life. Salvation includes a transformation of the inner person. The nature of the Christian is new and different. The unbroken pattern of sin and enmity with God will not continue when a person is born again. Those with genuine faith follow Christ, love their brothers, obey God's commandments, do the will of God, abide in God's word, keep God's word, do good works, and continue in the faith. Now, what's the first question immediately when you see a list like that? How often? How often? To what degree? And what about when you're not? In contrast, easy believism teaches that although some spiritual fruit is inevitable, that fruit might not be visible to others, and and Christians can even lapse into a state of Permanent spiritual barrenness. Now remember, some spiritual fruit is inevitable. Wait a second, how can you have some spiritual fruit if you're not saved? And that fruit might not be visible to others. Wait until you see the quote I have on MacArthur where he talks about fruit. And just remember this saying. John Murray says the crucial test of true faith is endurance to the end, abiding in Christ and continuance in the Word. He cannot abandon himself to sin. He cannot come under the dominion of sin. He cannot be guilty of certain kinds of unfaithfulness. Wait a second. What do you mean certain kinds of unfaithfulness? So there's certain kinds of unfaithfulness you care? Let us appreciate the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints and recognize that we may entertain the faith of our security in Christ only as we persevere in faith and holiness to the end. Which means you don't know you are secure. You only know it to the degree that you think you are by virtue of your own walk with God. MacArthur says, and save without a doubt, if a person fails to love and obey the Lord through the trials of life, then there's no evidence that he possesses saving faith. Really, you mean if you fail to trust the Lord in a trial, you're not saved? How many people do you know who came to church for a while had a little trouble in their life and left? Although they may have made a profession of faith in Christ, they cannot be identified as those who love Him because their lives are not characterized by an enduring obedience. Can you see why they're going to lack assurance? 
And remember, the purpose of 1 John isn't so you could know you're saved. It's so that you could have fellowship as a believer with the Lord. MacArthur says the gospel demands surrender not only for authority's sake, but also because surrender is the believer's highest joy. Such surrender is not an extraneous adjunct to faith. It's the very essence of believing. Now, I want you to ask you a question. When you say, I trust that chair, do you surrender to the chair? When I say to you, I've got $5 to give you, and you believe me, do you surrender to me? I would argue that surrender is not the very essence of believing. That believing is believing. Believing is trusting. Believing is relying. Believing is taking someone at their word. Believing is judging him faithful who promised. What saith the Scriptures? Is there a difference between justification before God and progressive sanctification? And we saw last time there clearly is. And that's why understanding the three tenths of salvation is so helpful. Now, do they ever acknowledge this? Uh, Seldom. But I did find a quote, and this is what it says. We have been justified, we are being sanctified, and we shall be glorified. No true believer will miss out on any stage of the process. Though in this life, we all find ourselves at different points along the way. This truth has been known historically as the perseverance of the saints. No doctrine has been more savaged by No lordship theology. Now, now, this is pejorative, isn't it? Is it that we don't believe in the lordship of Jesus Christ? No, we believe he's God. We believe he has a right to rule in our lives as believers. Romans 6 is clearly going to teach that. But we don't submit to him as Lord in order to be saved. We believe in him and what he's done for us on the cross. That is to be expected because the doctrine of perseverance is antithetical to the entire no-lordship system. In fact, what they have pejoratively labeled lordship salvation is nothing but this very doctrine. What doctrine? The doctrine of the perseverance of the saints. What do lordship salvation teachers do with discipleship passages? We've seen they make them salvation passages. Here's what MacArthur says. Let me say unequivocally that Jesus' summons to deny self and follow him was an invitation to salvation, not an offer of a higher life or a second step of faith following salvation. The contemporary teaching that separates discipleship from salvation springs from ideas that are foreign to Scripture. Every Christian is a disciple. Now, are we to say that Mark 8 and John 3, 16 are saying the same thing? Uh, I think not. While justification and glorification are guaranteed by God for every believer, it is not guaranteed, though desired and provided by God and His grace for every believer to experience ongoing progressive sanctification. And that's why in Romans 8, those whom He foreknew, He predestined, those He predestined, He called, those He called, He justified, those He justified, He glorified. What was missing? Sanctified. Because that isn't guaranteed. Positionally, it's guaranteed. Practically and progressively, it is not. And that's why we saw all these verses on should. We also should walk in newness of life. doesn't guarantee it, but that's the intended result. We should bear fruit to God, Romans 7, 4. We should serve in the newness of the Spirit, not in the oldness of the latter, Romans 7, 6. We should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. But it doesn't guarantee we will. We should walk in them, but it doesn't guarantee we will. We should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind. The implication is we might not. We should abstain from sexual morality, but believers at times haven't abstained. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, but it doesn't guarantee that we will. We should be careful to maintain good works, but at times believers haven't. So is it possible for a genuine believer in Christ to fall away from Christ instead of following him? The answer again is yes. And towards the end of last time, we saw these verses indicate a believer can fall into unbelief, can fall in his walk, can fall into calamity, 
can fall into sin, can fall into legalism and away from the principles of grace, can fall into reproach and the snare of the devil, can fall into temptation and snare and many harmful lusts, can fall into unbelief or disobedience, can fall into unfruitfulness or disuse, can fall from his own steadfastness, and can fall from his first love. Is it possible for a genuine believer to be unfruitful instead of fruitful? For Christ in the Bible says yes. Lordship salvation says no. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things, by the way, is it possible to lack those things? Absolutely. Lack what? Being fruitful. Is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren... Be even more diligent to make your call and election sure or evident, for if you do these things, you will never stumble. Is it possible for a genuine believer to apostatize or turn from the truth? The answer is yes. And again, taken from Tom Stiegel, the Bible actually teaches that it's possible for one who is eternally saved by God's grace to commit idolatry and apostasy, believe only for a while, not continue in the word of Christ, not abide in Christ, become disqualified in the race of the Christian life, resist God's chastening correction onto the point of physical death, stray from the faith, shipwreck faith, fall away from the faith, deny the faith, cast off initial faith and follow Satan, stray from the faith by loving money, stray from the faith by professing false doctrine, deny Christ and be faithless, and have your faith overthrown. Isn't it amazing when you study the Bible, what comes out? Yes, Pucci. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You know, it is, Lordship Salvation clearly has a dilemma when it comes to the salvation of children. Because, and here's how they get around it. They'll say, when, when a child gets saved, they make a commitment to be obedient to the Lordship of Christ, but at that time in their life, they do not understand the implications of that commitment. We're talking about a child who's seven, eight, nine. Okay? So what was the question? He's just saying if, if, a, if worship is true, how could any child, should be saying, child, make a commitment to serve? You just need to start open. Yeah. Okay, I, th- I think we're talking a, a young child. And the fact is this. You know, as a young child, you know, I made a confirmation vow. I made a promise and a pledge, which MacArthur says you need to make, and you did make when you got saved. By the way, when you got saved, did you make any promises, any pledges? Now, I believe the promise of God. I didn't make the promise. I believe the promise when I was saved. What about the sin unto death? Again, like Ananias and Sapphira and like carnal Christians, obviously, how do you explain the sin unto death if there's no such thing as the carnal Christian? Number five, lordship salvation annihilates absolute assurance of one's salvation by causing the person to look at their inconsistent walk instead of Christ's finished work and the unfailing promises of God to possess the absolute assurance of eternal life. Now, when we finally get to where we ended last time, wave your hand, okay? We're getting there. Now, we've been plugging away here. This is all review, but this is for your test. And this is to cement this in your thinking. Can a believer in Christ be certain and sure they are saved forever from the moment he believes and forever? The answer is yes. These things I have written to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And remember the word know is oida in the perfect tense, to know with certainty from the point of time you're saved to the point of time that you're living now that you have eternal life. That assurance is available in any theological system that does not grant you absolute assurance is false. Now, thinking of the theological system, in his book, Save Without a Doubt, which actually creates all kinds of doubts, John MacArthur gives 11 biblical tests of genuine salvation. Do you enjoy fellowship with God and Christ? Okay. Do you enjoy fellowship? Well, how often? 
Do you, are you sensitive to sin in your life? Depends on the day. Do you obey the scriptures? I mean, how do you come under that one? Oh yeah, I always obey. I obey the scriptures so I know I'm saved. Are you kidding me? What about self-deception? Do you reject this evil world? Do you love Christ and eagerly await His return? Do you see a decreasing pattern of sin in your life? The fact is, you know, as you're growing, you begin to see more sin in your life. Not because you're necessarily doing more sin, but now you're observing it more closely because you have a standard called the Word of God in order to see it. So you may not see a decreasing pattern. Do you love other Christians? Well, Do you receive answers to your prayers? Do you experience the ministry of the Holy Spirit? Can you discern between spiritual truth and error? You mean like lordship salvation? Have you suffered on account of your faith in Christ? If you haven't, it could be that you're not really saved. Wow. You know what this does to sensitive, analytical type people? Devastates them. Self-righteous people know but analytical, sensitive people devastate them. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 makes it clear, for by grace you've been saved, through faith. By the way, did Paul think they were saved? Of course. 1 John 5, 20. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. 1 John 2, 12. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. And we saw these verses last time. What's the basis of assurance primarily rest on? the finished work of Christ, and the unfailing promises of God. So that when you were saved, you understood that Jesus Christ, God who became a man, died for your sins and rose again, and through faith in Him, you received eternal life. What do the adherents of Lordship Salvation teach regarding assurance? No 100% assurance is possible until death. You should look at your fruit or behavior instead of the rut, your belief in Christ, for assurance of salvation. Now, if you're really consistent about that, the moment you trust Christ, you can't know you're saved. Because you have to wait to see if you've got the real saving faith, evidenced by certain fruit, which you subjectively evaluate as time goes on. And that's why even John MacArthur, as I read last time, admitted he did not have absolute assurance of salvation. John? So, so I guess John would say that salvation doesn't have to occur at this point in time. That's how you know, the process of you know, what they describe as their faith or something like that. But I mean, but I guess it's kind of like, is it almost like throughout the whole time it's kind of like, okay, yes, you need to obey, you need to submit to the Spirit. But then there's kind of like, okay, what would you think about that? How would you think about it? You know, it's really good to say that. Yeah. Well, what Dr. MacArthur would say, and, and what John was asking was, so does MacArthur believe that at a point in time you truly are saved? And, and here's where it gets fuzzy. Because he would admit that imputation of righteousness occurs at a point in time. He would also believe that regeneration precedes faith. But genuine saving faith is not an act of faith. It's an, the seed of faith is now planted so that it's going to be ongoing. And therefore, he views salvation as a process. And his view of salvation ultimately is not a whole lot different than the Roman Catholic. There's a lot of imparted righteousness idea instead of imputed righteousness. And as I said before, in Romans chapter 4, we have the whole doctrine of imputed righteousness in which we are justified in the eyes of God because the righteousness of Christ has been put to our account through simple childlike faith in Him so that we are declared righteous in the eyes of God. And it has nothing to do with our life. It has to do with Christ's work. Absolutely. He would say you do not look for assurance at some past act in your life, but you look at it as a present walk. You always find assurance in what the Lord is doing in you. It's not enough to see what the Lord has done for you. So he's trying to find assurance where? In sanctification instead of justification. Yes? Yes? 
Well, the Calvinistic view, remember, is this, and MacArthur is clearly, I just read a quote by him today on this. See, now, some Calvinists will say faith precedes regeneration. Most Calvinists will say regeneration precedes faith. And the thinking behind it is this. You are spiritually dead and therefore unable to believe. And unless God elects you to salvation and gives you the gift of faith and irresistible grace so that you find yourself believing, in order to believe, he has to make you alive and the first act of life is you believe. So you have to be born again to believe instead of believe to be born again. No, no, but they would say this, that if you're truly regenerated, having a new nature has to manifest itself and therefore you are going to have sanctification as a byproduct of that regeneration. You know what's really interesting about regeneration, if you just think about it for a minute? How many verses in the Bible can you give me on regeneration? Titus 3.5, you can mention that, right? Okay, Ephesians 2 says we were made alive. We were made alive, you could use that. John 3 is the great regeneration passage, you're born again. But interesting enough, not many passages on regeneration. Okay. Here's what John Piper says. Christ did not die to forgive sinners who go on treasuring anything above seeing and savoring God. And people who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. It's a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. If we don't want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. Wow. That means if you love the Green Bay Packers more than God, you're not saved. <laughs> Listen to what Gerstner says. This is just so telltale. Thus good works may be said to be a condition for obtaining salvation in that they inevitably accompany genuine faith. Good works, while a necessary complement of true faith, are never the meritorious grounds of justification, of acceptance before God from the essential truth that no sinner himself can merit salvation. The antinomian draws the erroneous conclusion that good works need not even accompany faith in the saying. The question is not whether good works are necessary to salvation, but in what way are they necessary? As the inevitable outworking of saving faith they are necessary for salvation. I mean, can you be any clearer? By the way, what does Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 say? It's not of works. Not of works. Not as merely the ground, but as the means, and not only the means, but the result. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yes, Angela. Okay, do they have the idea that God disciplines his children? It's probably somewhere there. Because they do have to admit believers still do sin. You know, and when they get to Hebrews 12, you still have to deal with it. So it's buried somewhere underneath there. Yeah, but it's not all that significant in their teaching. They usually would just put you into the unsaved category. I read to you the letter to John MacArthur, which was just amazing as it came from someone from his church. And I just love how it ends. MacArthur says, The pulpit is the creator of anxious hearts, but it's also to give comfort and assurance to those who love Christ. It's the creator of anxious hearts. Then he says this, listen to this. Most of the Puritans thought that believers could not expect assurance until long after conversion and only after a life of extended faithfulness. Oh, that's what he's saying. They tended to make assurance depending on the believer's ability to live at an almost unattainable level of personal holiness as we might expect. The Puritans demanding preaching led to a widespread lack of assurance among their flocks. You mean, kind of like this guy? It's really no different. R.C. Sproul, a simple way to remember the essence of the doctrine of perseverance is to learn this ditty. Here we go. If we have it, we never lose it. If we lose it, we never had it. This cute way of affirming that full and final apostasy is never the lot of the Christian. Can you imagine me giving you a car, Philip? I give you a car, 
and somehow you lose it, and then you say, you know what, Pastor? You never did give me that card, did you? <laughs> and I'd say, you are a liar, Philip. You are a liar. One pastor tells new converts, you must be safe for at least three years before you've accumulated enough good works to be sure that you are truly saved and not just a stony ground hearer. Isn't that comforting? At least three years. Now, what verse is that? Five-point Calvinist teacher A.W. Pink goes on, readers, if there is a reserve in your obedience, you're on your way to hell. Now, that's obviously extreme. Again, we looked at biblical examples of assurance. Job, David, the apostles, Martha, the apostle Paul, the Corinthian believers, the Thessalonian believers, the Ephesian believers, the Philippian believers, the Colossian believers, the Jewish believers in Christ. And we noted that secondary evidences of salvation provide subjective indicators of a new birth, a new nature, etc., but do not provide the objective basis for assurance. Is it true whom the Lord loves he will discipline? That's true. That's true. But sometimes it's hard to discern if the Lord is disciplining someone or if that's just bad choices. Or... Does the Bible teach that all genuine believers will persevere in the faith and godliness till the end of their life? And we noted the answer is, is no. Listen to this. This, is, this probably made me understand why Piper calls himself a seven-point Calvinist. Because they have seven points here. Our faith must endure to the end if we are to be saved. Obedience, evidencing inner renewal from God is necessary for final salvation. Now that's pretty obvious, isn't it? If you don't obey, you're not saved. God's elect cannot be lost. There is a falling away of some believers. Now I'm already confused. But if it persists, it shows that their faith was not genuine and they were not born of God. So I guess they weren't believers at all after. If it persists, how long does it have to persist? What if you just begin to doubt and question and you die? Number five, God justifies us on the first genuine act of saving faith. But in doing so, here's your answer to your question, John. He has a view to all subsequent acts of faith contained, as it were, like a seed in that first act. So it's not just an act of faith, it's going to be faithfulness. God works to cause his elect to persevere. Therefore, we should be zealous to make our calling and election sure. Piper says, no Christian can be sure that he's a true believer then. <laughs> Do you understand why? Hence, there is an ongoing need to be dedicated to the Lord and deny ourselves so that we might make it. That's pretty clear, isn't it? R.C. Sproul even shared this several years ago. A while back, I had one of those moments of acute self-awareness and suddenly the question hit me, R.C., what if you're not one of the redeemed? What if your destiny is not heaven after all, but hell? Let me tell you that I was flooded in my body with a chill that went from my head to the bottom of my spine. I was terrified. I tried to grab a hold of myself. I thought, well, it's a good sign that I'm worried about this. Only true Christians really care about salvation. I don't know that that's true. The rich young ruler did. But then I began to take stock of my life and I looked at my performance. My sins came pouring into my mind and the more I looked at myself, the worse I felt. I thought, maybe it's true. Maybe I'm not saved after all. I went to my room and began to read my Bible and on my knees I said, well, here I am. I can't point to my obedience. There's nothing I can offer. I know some people only flee to the cross to escape hell. Then I remember John 6:68. 6, Peter was also uncomfortable, but he realized that being uncomfortable with Jesus was better than any other option. So, where did he finally seek assurance from? He went to himself and his works, and he then shifted to, you've got to go back to the cross to find assurance which contradicts Calvinism here. 
Does the Bible teach all believers will persevere in the faith? Calvinist theology answers yes. They teach if you're truly elect, you'll persevere in the faith till the end of your life. Arminian theology answers no. They teach a believer can lose his faith and in doing so lose his salvation. And both of these views robs the believer in Christ of the absolute assurance of salvation. What does the Bible say? The biblical viewpoint, eternal salvation is not a prize or reward, but is a gift of God's grace because of the cross work of Jesus Christ received through faith alone in Christ alone. Crowns or rewards are available to faithful believers who run and finish the race by faith, but they are not guaranteed to all believers and can be lost as some believers do not run or finish well. Does the Bible teach that all genuine believers will persevere in the faith? What about Lot, who lived in ongoing carnality? Solomon, who died worshipping false deities. King Saul, who committed suicide. Those Corinthian believers that God divinely disciplined to heaven via death. Demas, who forsook Paul, having loved this present world. By the way, the Lord Shippers would probably deny the salvation of Saul and Demas. They're kind of stuck on the other three, though. What about Alexander and Hymenaeus, whose faith were made shipwreck, who God was disciplining? Soil, too, that believed for a while, but when persecution came, they fell away. Believers at Ephesus, who would not endure sound doctrine, would be turned to fables. What about the warning passage in Hebrews directed towards genuine believers? Lord shippers would say they're not believers. I think the scriptures are clear they are. Does God desire believers to persevere in the faith? Yes. Does God reward those believers who persevere in the faith? Yes. Does God guarantee that all believers will persevere in the faith? No. It's desired but not guaranteed, resulting in a reward or loss of reward, but never the loss of eternal salvation. Number six. An hour later. Now you understood all that, right? Covered so far? Okay, hopefully that will be really clear. Number six, the Lordship of Salvation muddles meaningful motivations. Let's say that ten times quick. To serve Christ out of his love for us and our thankfulness to him for saving us. And it makes a godly life an experiment to be lived in order to prove to ourselves that we are saved. Now just think about this for a minute. If you don't know for sure you're saved, and if you don't know for sure you're elect, and the only proof of that is your life, you better live a holy life in order to prove what? That you're saved. That you're elect. Are you doing it then for the glory of God? Are you doing it out of the love of Christ? Or is the fear of hell somewhere there? Because of the lack of absolute assurance of salvation, one's life is a Big experiment, Jody Dillo calls it, experimental predestinarianism. In other words, you're, it's experimental whether or not you're truly predestined. One's life is a big experiment in order to discover if they're truly elect or not. Thus, the fear of hell plays at least a part in their motivation to live for Jesus Christ. And though the fear of eternal judgment in hell are great reasons to trust in Christ and be saved, they are never presented in in the scriptures, as motivations to live for Christ. Okay. Now let's go to Second Corinthians chapter four here for a minute. Second Corinthians chapter four. John MacArthur says, The gospel according to Jesus is nothing like that. It represents Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and demands that those who receive him take him for who he is. In the words of John Flavel, a 17th century English Puritan, the gospel offer of Christ includes, now catch this, all his offices. So do you have to believe that he is the prophet of God? Do you have to believe in his high priestly position under the Order of Melchizedek to be saved. And the gospel faith just so receives him, to submit to him, as well as to be redeemed to him, to imitate him in the holiness of his life. Does the gospel require that you imitate him in the holiness of his life? 
as well as to reap the purchases and fruits of his death. It must be an entire receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you can see, if you embrace that, your Christian life becomes again a way to imitate Christ and the holiness of his life in order to be saved. Philippians 1.21, Paul says though, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if we live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I'm hard pressed between the two having a desire to depart to be with Christ, which is far better, nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. Notice, for me to live is, is Christ. Was he living his life in order to prove that he was elect, in order to be assured of his salvation? He knew he was saved. To me to live as Christ and to die would be gain. He knew he was saved. To depart, with, to be with Christ, he knew he was saved wasn't motivated by an experimental predestinarian. Look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. Everyone would agree, basically, this is a, mo- a passage on motivation. I beseech you, reference to believers, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies. You don't present your body or yield your body, or even in terms of lordship, surrender your body in order to be saved. He's appealing to those who are brethren to do it as a living sacrifice, holy acceptable, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable for you now. It's an act of spiritual service to do this. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, when we come to this, One of the passages they like using is 2 Corinthians 13. Let's go there, I'm sorry. First, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. And they say there's nothing wrong with examining your life to know whether you're saved or not. And to evaluate whether your works prove your salvation or not. Because we're told to do that in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith Test yourselves, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? So examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. And there are those who teach that you should constantly examine yourself to see whether or not you're saved. Now, remember, how did we start our devotional tonight? 1 Timothy 4.16 Take heed to yourself. Examine yourself, right? But in order to know whether you're saved? No. As far as your walk with the Lord is concerned. So how is 2 Corinthians 13.5 misinterpreted? Are you a Christian? Many people who claim to be point to some event in the past to substantiate their claim. But inviting Jesus to come into your heart in the past is not proof that you're genuinely saved. I would agree to that. 2 Corinthians 13.5, Paul says to the Corinthian church, examine yourself whether you're in the faith Prove yourselves. You wouldn't have said that if some event in the past were obviously the answer. The Bible never verifies anyone's salvation by the past, but by the present. If there is no evidence of salvation in your life now, you need to face the fact that you may not be a Christian. You need to examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. How does one do that? Jesus shows us in the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to know you're a Christian, compare your life with the standard Christ presents in the Sermon on the Mount. I'm sure that's what Paul had in mind in chapter 13, verse 5, don't you think? Examine yourself. He certainly was thinking Sermon on the Mount, wasn't he? As I pointed out before, in the Sermon on the Mount, does it mention the death of Jesus Christ? Does it mention the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Does it even mention the Gospel? That Paul preached in 1 Corinthians 15, and yet you're to examine yourself to see whether you're saved? Yes, Philip. Yes. 
Yeah, um, and I would say this. In 2 Corinthians, the context and flow of thought is critical to understand this verse. This is a great example. You pluck that verse out and you can make it again, stand in all four and squeal in any direction you want it to go. So what's the context? Well, beginning in chapter 10, let's go back there, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, by the way, a little tongue-in-cheek there, because he was being accused of being authoritative and heavy-handed. Who is present in presence and lowly among you, but being absent and bold towards you, that was another rap that he was getting. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with the confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. Now, there's another criticism he was getting. You know, Paul, he just walks according to the flesh. He just carnally does it in his own power. He overextends his authority. By the way, anything new? Heard this before? Verse 4, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity to the obedience of Christ. Verse 7, Do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. In other words, if someone considers themselves, well, I'm of Christ, then consider us, we're of Christ. By the way, how did they become of Christ? Through Paul. And that's going to be the whole flow of thought here. Is If I'm an illegitimate apostle and you were supposedly saved through my ministry, what does that make you? Illegitimate. And if you're legitimate, what does that make me? Legitimate. That's going to be the whole flow of thought leading up to it. And it's in contrast to the false teachers that had slunk up to them. He says in verse 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, these false teachers, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere which God appointed us, a sphere, sphere which especially includes you. For we are not overextending ourselves, that was one of the raps, as though our authority did not extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. Don't you remember who brought you the gospel? Not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors, but having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere to preach the gospel in regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. And then in chapter 11, he says, Oh, that you would bear with me a little, in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. Why? For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Well, how would that happen? For if he some false teacher who comes, preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you may not have accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, and that was another criticism they had of him. Yet I am not in knowledge... But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one for what I lacked. The brethren who came from Macedonia, the Philippians, supplied. 
And in everything I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. The truth of Christ is in me. No one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. So what's the problem? Verse 13, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to his, their works. I say again, let no one think of me a fool. If otherwise, at least receive me as a fool, that I may boast a little what I speak. I speak not according to the Lord but as it were foolishly in this confidence of boasting. Seeing that many boast according to the flesh, you're used to that, I'll also boast. For you put up with fools gladly. That's not exactly a compliment. Since you yourselves are so wise, you put up with it if one brings you into bondage and false teaching does that. If one devours you and false teaching does that. If one takes from you and false teaching does that. If one exalts himself, if one strikes you on the face, to your shame, I say that we were too weak for that. Now, this is just so utterly sarcastic because remember, they would say, oh, Paul, he's weak. And he says, yeah, I'm really sorry. I need to apologize. I didn't exalt myself. I didn't slap you on the face. I was too weak for that. You're kind of sarcastic here, Paul. You're right, he is. But whatever, anyone is bold. I speak foolishly. I am bold also. Are they? Who's they? The false teachers, Hebrews, so am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And I'll tell you, here are my, here's my pedigree. In labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews five times I received forty stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've been in the deep in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the cities, in perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil and sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst and fasting often, cold and nakedness, beside the other things, what comes upon me daily my deep concern for all the churches. You know, when someone usually would set forth their resume, and they say, you want to know if I'm legitimate? You know, look at all these things. Paul just said, just absolutely sarcastic and humbling. You want to see my resume? Look at what I have suffered for Christ. Do you think any of the false teachers are doing that? They're boasting of where they were trained, all this such. And you know, Paul, he doesn't even collect fees. What kind of teacher doesn't collect fees? That means he's not even worth his salt. And that's why Paul says, I'm really sorry, I apologize, I, I robbed other churches. I didn't take money from you. Forgive me. I mean, <laughs> now, chapter 12, it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. So then he talks about how he was caught up in the third heaven, wasn't allowed to speak, given a thorn in the flesh, God's grace was sufficient, how he takes pleasures and infirmities. Verse 11, I have become a fool in boasting, but you have compelled me. For I ought to have been commended by you, for in nothing was I behind the most eminent apostles though I am nothing. In fact, truly the signs of an apostle were accomplished among you with all perseverance and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. Verse 17, Did I take advantage of you by any of those whom I sent to you? Well, of course not. Verse 13, chapter 13. This will be the third time I'm coming to you. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. I have told you before and foretell as if I were present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare my authority. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, who is not weak towards you, but mighty in you, for though he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God toward you. Examine yourselves. In, in other words, instead of examining me 
and scrutinizing me as if I've been the problem when I'm the one who brought you the truth and taught you the word. And it's these false teachers that have infiltrated. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified? Now what's he saying there? He's again saying, listen, if you claim you're a believer and I'm the tool that God uses as an instrument to lead you to Christ, that makes me legitimate. And if you're not legitimate, or you have a problem with the legitimacy of my ministry, then that means you're not legitimate either. You are adakamas, disqualified. Now, is he questioning whether they're saved? Is he encouraging them to evaluate whether they're saved or not? Now, I want you to see, let's continue on, verse 7. Now, I pray to God, that you do no evil, not that we should appear approved, but that you should do what is honorable, though we may seem disqualified in your eyes. We don't measure up. For we can do nothing against the truth, but for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. And this also we pray, that you may be made complete. Therefore I write these things, being absent, lest being present, I should use sharpness, according to the authority which the Lord has given me for edification and not for destruction. Finally, brethren, farewell. Does he think they're not saved? How does he end? Calls them brethren. Now, will you tell an unbeliever, become complete? Be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you? Would you tell that to an unbeliever? Greet one another with a holy kiss. Will you tell that to an unbeliever? All the saints greet you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Is he questioning whether they're saved? He's not questioning that at all. But I would say this. Carnal believers take a lot of time. Just think, Paul spent 29 chapters on these carnal believers. 29 chapters. Two books. You know of any other book in the New Testament or church that took that much time, space? Carnal believers complicate life and take a lot of time, oftentimes. That Wouldn't you think Paul would rather have spent his time evangelizing, spent his time doing other things? But he's here, out of love, trying to help these carnal believers. And what do they do? They question whether he's even legitimate. Carnal believers can become very delusionary. Very goofed up. And so, while the Lordshippers take this passage to say, you want to know if you're saved? See if you're living according to the Sermon on the Mount? This context of this and the content of this verse has nothing to do with evaluating whether you're saved, but simply connecting the dots. If you're saved and I led you to Christ, obviously that makes my ministry legitimate. Therefore, why are you kowtowing to these false teachers that are undermining me and the message of grace that I am preaching. And that's the whole flaw of thought to the passage. What should motivate a sinner saved by grace to now serve the Lord? Let me mention here five things, and then we'll break. One is the glory of God. 2 Corinthians 4, while it's handy. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15. For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. By that, we just say, you know what motivates you? That God is worthy of your service. He's worthy of your trust. And that should motivate you. Secondly is the fear of the Lord and the Bema. In 2 Corinthians 5, We read in verse 8, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. By the way, did he have absolute assurance of his salvation there? Did he know absent from the body meant present with the Lord? Absolutely. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in his body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror or the fear of the Lord we persuade men. 
So the fear of the Lord, what does it mean? It means you take God seriously. And you recognize one day you will give an account at the Bema. And can that motivate you? Yeah, it sometimes snaps me right out of it. When I just start to daze spiritually and go mentally astray and just stop and think, you know, I'm going to give an account of this day to the Lord. I'm going to stand before Him one day. It has a way of motivating me. Not so much for the reward's sake, though I would like a reward in order to cast my crown at the feet of the Lord Jesus. But it's just a reminder of the sense that I am going to give an account to the Lord one day. He then goes on to talk about the motivation, which I believe is the greatest motivation of all, the love and grace of Christ. Verse 14 tells us, For the love of Christ compels us, because we judge thus that if one died for all, and he did, then all died in Christ, your position, and he died for all, substitution, that those who live with a new life in Christ should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. What's motivating? The love and grace of Christ. Fourthly, the destiny of the lost. Verse 16, Therefore from now on we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. In other words, we see people from a divine viewpoint instead of a human viewpoint. We see them as either saved or lost. And we know the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Thus we keep on preaching Christ and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus. And you know, the destiny of the lost has been a great motivation for many a missionary to go where Christ has not been preached before. along with the privilege of ambassadorship. And the passage ends by talking how we are now ambassadors for Christ. And by the way, being, being an ambassador for Christ is a great honor. You know, if you respected your president, and many of us don't, his position, but not his person or his policies, but if you respected your president and he asked you to be an ambassador, you would take that as a really great honor. And that's what Jesus Christ has done for you and me. He has made us ambassadors for Christ. We represent him on foreign turf. One day we're going home to heaven. In the meantime, he wants to use us in the ministry of reconciliation. He's given to us the message of reconciliation, the gospel, so that we plead with the unsaved to be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Now again, all of this is connected to your position in Christ. And being motivated to serve and being enabled to serve is two different things. One may be very motivated to serve and end up in Romans 7. Apart from recognizing your position in Romans 6 and the power of the Holy Spirit in Romans 8, you could still end up in Romans 7. Again, cranking it out in your own flesh. But these are legitimate motivators set forth to us in Scripture. As a composite, and you know, depending on the person and maybe the situation in your life, one may motivate you may perhaps more than the other. But they're all there. It's like, why should you serve your mate? I don't know that it's just one reason. So well, I love my May, yes. If I don't, she's going to be really mad, yes. <laughs> and if I, uh, yeah, and uh, you know, so there may be more than one motivation, and the same it is when it comes to the Lord. But I want you to notice what's missing. No fear of hell. Fear of hell is never a motivation to live the Christian life. We're not experimental predestinarians living our lives to prove that perhaps we are one of God's elect and waiting till the end of our life by enduring faith to find out if we really are. After our break,